Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What's happening, Big Dog Nation? What is happening to the Wolf Pack? Hello, everybody. Happy football, man. It's another beautiful day. I'm recording this on Sunday morning. So this is before all the games will be played again. So won't capture any of that new data. But this is just kind of my thoughts on what's going on this week. Not really needed uh, for this week's episode anyways. Uh, well, I'm going to make this a, a quicker one because I just want to go over a couple of quick hitter points and let you guys go about your day, your Monday, your beautiful Mondays. Hopefully uh, start to another beautiful week. All right. But before we get on to the actual content and the episode itself, man. Y'all know what time it is. Hit that intro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Anyways, it's uh, look, man, any week we get football is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful day. So uh, we're excited. We're excited this week. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, the only game that has happened already is the Atlanta game. So the Atlanta Jets, because that was at 6.30 a.m. Pacific, uh, 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. And uh, a lot of a lot of interesting things to take away from that game. Just quick hitters. I haven't dug into anything too crazy. But, you know, Cordero Patterson saw his most opportunities so far this season. I believe he had like nine targets and 14 carries. Uh, basically splitting carries in the backfield with uh, Mike Davis, whereas before uh, he was he really wasn't getting too much work on the ground, and he didn't really turn that into much either. So, uh, but again, he's getting a ton of targets in that offense. Obviously, Calvin Ridley was out this week, so that maybe had a little bit to do with it uh, because you know typically you you see targets flow to the running back position when there's like not enough receiving weapons, like actual receivers, wide receivers, etc., that are available. Uh, but it's pretty encouraging. I mean, it's, it's interesting. What do we do with a Cordero Patterson right now, right? So, you know, a lot of people said sell high after the first couple of weeks. A lot of people say sell for like a third or whatever. That was probably too low. Uh, I, 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 w I always stood at the line. They're like, hey, if you get a running back that kind of makes a dip impact, but you know probably won't be around next next year, kind of like Mike Davis last year, actually. I think getting a second for that running back is a big, big steal. Might not be the maximum every league can get, but that second round pick can turn into a future long term starter, probably a wide receiver. Uh, whereas, you know, Cordero Patterson probably isn't that. Um, if you're a contending team, like, I don't know if I would necessarily pay a second unless, like, I really need a running back that bad. But then if I did, it kind of brings into question, like, am I really a contender? Um, so in Dynasty, it's still kind of tricky, but in Redraft, if you got him, man, you kind of hit the jackpot. Like, I, I picked him up in waivers. Uh, I think like week one or something before he went to ham and uh, just been sitting on him. And now he's just been starting for me because I went in that league. I didn't I didn't really draft running backs to start um, early other than Alvin Kamara. So he's been super clutch for me uh, in, in a couple of those leagues. But I think in Dynasty, man, if, if you have Cordero Patterson, I'd still probably be unloading him uh, just for a second round pick. Because even though like he's kind of putting up big production numbers like. I think it's it's hard for him to continue this pace on the receiving end, right? I mean, it's he, he's on pace for basically NFL league leading uh, in the NFL department or in the in the running back department in terms of what he's been able to do. So, I think that's an area um, where we can kind of we can kind of reevaluate and, and see what's going on there because he's not he's not someone that's going to provide long term value. So you got to get off him. And then secondly. The second week now, Matt Ryan's been putting together a, a pretty decent, uh, pretty decent showing for the second week. So you know, Matt Ryan looked pretty washed for the first three weeks. The entire Atlanta offense looked looked pretty damn awful. Um, I was looking for them to kind of rebound and him to rebound specifically in these next two, in the last two weeks with Washington uh, and now the Jets because they're a couple of weak defenses. So if he kind of shot the bed, then uh, we wouldn't really have that much hope uh, for Matt Ryan. But he didn't. So so it was kind of good news uh, from that perspective. And um, he put together a pretty good performance. And him putting together a good performance led finally to Kyle Pitt's breakout week, right? And if you guys think back, uh, you know, there was a lot uh, – for the first few weeks, I think there was a lot of, like, you know, Kyle Pitt's uh, FUD, which is just, like, fear, uncertainty, and doubt pushing because, you know, everyone's like, oh, what, what is this, like, a waste of draft pick? You picked them too high, not paying off a draft stock. Meanwhile, though, I was kind of paying attention to the peripherals, like his percentage of routes run, where he's lining up. He's lining up a ton in the slot, a ton in the wide, being used like a wide receiver. You know, we hear the catchphrase, you know, a tight end being used as a wide receiver quite often, but, you know, very rarely is that actually true. So it's pretty dope to see that finally play out for, for someone like Kyle Pitts. Uh, and obviously this week, Calvin Ridley was out too. So he really had an opportunity to shine. 
and he did. I mean, he put up uh, in my tight end premium leagues. So I think he put up like thirty something, thirty something points. Uh, not ten targets, nine catches, a hundred plus yards, and a touchdown. So he finally blew up. Right? We talk about chasing opportunity instead of chasing production because production doesn't tell you everything. But if you're getting on the field a lot and getting the opportunity, eventually, if you're a freaking good player, you're gonna produce. Obviously, if you stink. You're not going to produce, but if you stink, you're not going to continue to get all those opportunities either. So that that's kind of like the way the way I think about it here. Um, and then the other thing is, I think when it comes to Kyle Pitts, like he's he's like even even before this week, he was kind of producing pretty well already for a rookie tight end. The only the only thing that he wasn't getting was touchdowns. And I already said like, look, eventually the touchdowns are going to come, right? So we w- I wouldn't really worry about it too much, but. I think what's what's the most interesting with Kyle Pitts is like kind of how they're using him. So if you are if you're a Kyle Pitts, uh, if you're if you have Kyle Pitts on your team, like I, I think you're just sitting pretty, man, sitting pretty because tight end is an absolute fucking wasteland. And, and with George Kittle out again uh, on IR now, I believe it just continues to be a shit show. If you don't have a Travis Kelsey or Darren Waller, I mean, you're getting by with like Dan Schultz and stuff like that. But in Dynasty, those are not going to be your long-term solution so if you if you hit young on a Kyle Pitts it's going to be it's going to be pretty nice man I think he's going to get continue to get usage I, I was already drooling over his usage in the in the department of routes run route participation uh slot alignment usage and stuff like that so now that he he is where he's at like I think I think we're we're going to be we're going to be going to the moon here all right so um st- stay tight on Kyle Pitts just keep riding him and you're going to get disappointing performances and that's okay that that's totally fine uh, to have that it doesn't it doesn't mean that uh, you have to sell high or anything like that i mean rest in peace to all the people that were that said i'm gonna wait to buy low on kyle pitts after year one it's, it's just not gonna happen because his usage has been very very top end elite for young for all tight ends especially but especially for a rookie tight end it's been in the upper echelon so i'd be very comfortable uh, if you actually invest in kyle pitts i myself have a ton of kyle pitts across some of my league so i'm sitting pretty uh, just enjoying the show and it's going to be a, it's going to be a beautiful 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 season all right that's just a quick recap of the one game that i saw but the main point of today's episode the main things i want to cover is the biggest mistakes i've made so far right so i usually wait until week four right uh, until after week four is done to kind of do an assessment so that we have some data points now this isn't to say like oh i'm completely wrong and you know, I, I, I'm completely ignoring everything I did in the offseason. It's still only four games, but there's a lot to glean from four games, right? You can you can start identifying some trends and you can really start looking at um, looking at what people are doing and, you know, extrapolating some of your offseason mistakes. So for me, I like to do it in week four. And usually I put out a Twitter thread, too, and I'll probably do it again this year. Uh, I'm probably going to do that one midseason instead of week four. But I want to do an episode to cover because I think there's a lot of actionable stuff that, that you can do that I've been doing personally uh, across my leagues. And, and the other thing is week four is the perfect time to really start if not execute trades to start planting the seeds to execute trades because this is when you know teams that are going like 0 and 3 0 and 4 start looking to next year in dynasty right this is when teams that are 3 and 1 and 4 and 0 start making a push for the playoff push this is be this is where the arms race begins um, and there's always an arms race between top contending teams in dynasty you know they're selling their future to to load up and upgrade their lineup because everyone wants to win championships when you have that window to win you got to push for it right you got to push for you cannot be scared to push your chips in the middle and you cannot be scared to lose a trade uh, in dynasty if it helps you secure the bag. All right. So I made a couple of trades and I'll probably walk through a couple of them here. But for a couple of my contending teams where, you know, I was really, you know, trying to trying to extend my my bench, extend my depth, upgrade my starters. And I made a couple of trades that probably losing in value, right? But I really need to do it because of the way the leagues are structured and because the window for winning is so tight. And also a lot of those leagues leagues are like empire formats where, you know, there's an empire rolling pot where, you know, percentage of the, uh, of the entry fee goes in the pot every single year. And then the winner who meets the empire criteria wins all, wins all the pot. So for my, most of my leagues, that's if first person to win three times gets the empire pot. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a row. Other people do like two in a row, then they get the Empire Pot. So I'm in a couple of those. So I made a I made a ton of massive trades this week as a contender to kind of push my chips in the middle, and that's that's something that you that people I think are are scared to do. And you know it pays to do that early because when you wait till later and everyone's doing it, then it becomes a seller's market for rebuilders, and it's not a buyer's market. When you do it early, you jump on the wagon early, people might say like, oh, four weeks is like two weeks to make those moves, or two weeks, four weeks is too early to give up, or whatever. Uh, But 
I like to make those moves early because you want to be first as a rebuilder and you want to be first as a contender. You want to be first to market there because you want to be you want it to be a seller's market for whatever you're doing, right? So if you're the first to rebuild, if you're the first to say my team's tanking, I'm looking for rookie picks, that means you're the first buy on the market for rookie picks and it means that you can kind of set the price, right? And then everyone else follows. Versus if you wait till later and four or five teams know they're not making the playoffs, then you can bet your ass four or five teams are going to be trying to trade for rookie picks and it's become a it's going to become a seller's market for rookie picks and a buyer's market for veterans. And that's not a market you want to be in for a rebuilder. But right now it's the exact opposite what I'm saying. So I, what I'm saying is now you can be you can force yourself to become a buyer's market for uh, for veterans on, and, and not take part in the seller's market for veterans down the line when, you know, the top four or five teams all know they're making playoffs trying to make a push. So I try and make some of those moves early so I can take advantage of that price. I can take advantage of that being first to market and kind of get my teams in place. Right. So. There's a lot of stuff that I can do from that. And, but before we get into it, I want to talk about the mistakes that I made and certain players that I was totally off on, which I'm now pivoting and helping my teams and contending teams and making some of those moves. All right. So the first player I want to talk about is Cooper Cup. Now, I wasn't really like low on Cooper Cup per se. I think I was probably like at market, maybe even slightly above market. I had him probably in my, I think in my like, top 50 or top, top 40 players, but I just really didn't foresee him getting the monster volume that he's getting, right? Like, like, you know, it, his usage in the past has mostly been as a slot, and Robert Woods has been much more diverse. You know, he's been more of the outside player. And with Matthew Stafford coming in, I kind of saw, you know, I, I, I couldn't, I didn't know who would really take that step forward. I had Cup ahead of Woods mainly because I thought Cup had bigger red zone appeal and he's a little bit younger, but I did not think the gap was was actually that big so um i think that's one thing that i did not foresee and cup is absolutely balling out now he he slowed down a little bit um i think last week but he's still getting uh monster target volume he's getting monster air yards and all that so he's he's just someone that's been great and you know i i put out a poll last week about um about cooper cup and you know kind of what what people thought about him versus like Stephon Diggs, Calvin Ridley, Devontae Adams, stuff like that. I would still give up Cooper Cup to get any of those players uh, because I think longer term, I prefer them in Dynasty. And I don't I don't expect Cooper Cup to keep up this like wide receiver one overall pace. But I was absolutely wrong in terms of measuring his upside and, and kind of what went wrong there is like, I just, I'm, honestly, I just didn't know who to pick. And when that happens, I usually bet on the cheaper horse. But it turns out that you know, Cooper Cup's yak ability, Cooper Cup's ability to get open, and Cooper Cup's ability to kind of, you know, ball out deep is making him win. You know, he has he has 31% of his team's uh, air yards this year. Uh, and that's mo that's monster volume on air yards, but he also has monster volume on the target side. So he's just someone that I think I have him in my redraft leagues, but I, I literally don't have any exposure in Dynasty. Um, so if you, if, you know, if you're looking to get a Cooper Cup, like I think, if you can get him for a first, maybe a first plus a second, I think that's great. Uh, I don't know if I'd pay two first for him in Superflux because there's very few wide receivers I would pay two first for because the odds, there's a good chance that, that one of those firsts is just going to be worth more than them by itself because it's very hard for wide receivers to hit that set, uh, ceiling value. Um, but, it, you know, maybe like two first for Cooper Cup and a second. I think those, those are probably deals you can get done if you want to get them on your team. Um, but personally, he, he's, he's probably a little bit out of my price range, so I'm not really making a huge push for him uh, on, on my contenders. I'll, I'll talk about some of the other players that I think you can get for a little bit cheaper that I've been pushing for. Um, but but again, man, shout out to Cooper Cup. Sorry to you guys for being wrong on that one. I definitely did not foresee that one coming. If I did, I would have had him much higher uh, in my dynasty ranks. But, you know, there he is. And the second one, though, the second one that I was the most wrong on, and this is one I don't really know what to do with, it's it's a combo. It's between Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel, right? Like, I thought for sure that Ayuk was going to emerge as the number one wide receiver. I was, I was very, very confident in that. Given his rookie production profile, given his draft capital, given his yak ability, given the fact that he was able to line up anywhere across the field, given the fact that he stepped into the number one wide receiver role as a rookie and was able to beat uh, opposing NFL cornerbacks to produce the way that he did, check his pro, uh, pro football focus grade. He was also very high, one of the top performing wide receivers last year. Then couple that with the film side. Um, I, I rely on Matt Harmon a lot, his reception perception. 
tell me how uh, because he quanti- he quantifies film for me, right? And puts it in a way that I can actually understand. One of the top guys that Matt Harmon loved as well. And me and him have had a lot of back and forths on Twitter talking about that and not what to do with them. And he's just been a ghost, right? He started off in the doghouse and doghouse plus injuries, so which gave me some hope. It's like, ah, you know, maybe it's a hamstring injury, maybe it's, maybe it's whatever. But he just has not produced at all. I mean, his, his performance has been really poor based on pro football, football focus grading. His efficiency has not been there. And he's been grossly outproduced by Debo I've I've definitely underestimated Debo Samuel I mean if you look at Debo Samuel last year his usage was almost like a running back right um and I I do not like to chase those types of eight out players now he's a yak god like in terms of once the ball is in his hands but the way he's being used this year is is completely is completely different right I mean last year his air yards was like non-existent It, it was it was so so low but this year He's kind of get, he's still not like a down the field machine um, that that you would want to see, but he's definitely getting a lot more um, a lot more air yards. So it, it's 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 this is one where it's like, what could I have done to um, to to avoid this type of disaster? Because I, I went heavy on on Brandon Ayuk, so I'm definitely feeling the pain a lot. And you know, people say you know maybe I should have taken into account that you know he performed more when George Kittle was out and and Debo Samuel was out, and that's while that's true, but a lot of wide receivers get injured, and you don't, you still don't see the rookie step up to the level that Brandon Ayuk did. So when I see that type of rookie production right off, right off the bat, right out the gate, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm more than willing to bet on that player because history shows us that those are very, very good bets, right? Um, and and that's really kind of what it comes down to is, is. I don't think I can make a process adjustment here. The only thing I can do is I still like Debo, right? So that was the thing. Like I didn't, I didn't hate Debo at all. It wasn't like I thought Debo sucked. I just thought Brandon Ayuk was a little bit more uh, versatile. I probably should not have had them gapped as far as I did because of the unknowns, right? There's Trey Lance coming in. We don't know what 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 he's gonna do. We don't know what Jimmy Garoppolo is gonna do. We don't know exactly what a fully healthy George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, and Debo was gonna do. I think that's probably my biggest mistake if I think about it. Right? Is uh, I, I kind of projected that, and I projected with too much confidence that Brandon Ayuk's going to win, and the confidence was was reflected in the in the gap of my rankings. Right, they probably should have been a little bit closer. There's no way I would have come into the season ranking Debo ahead of Ayuk. That just wouldn't have happened based on all the data that we were presented. But but I could have had him closer and made that bet. Now, did I acquire some Debo Samuel in the offseason? Yeah, because I still thought he was pretty damn cheap. But I would have got a lot more if I was a little bit more conservative in terms of you know scoping out those probabilities and trying to assign that value so the gap between Debo and Ayuk wasn't like a three round gap or four round gap or whatever I was, whatever it was that I had I don't remember exactly what it was but it wouldn't have been that high you know and if you look at Debo Samuel like he's still not a downfield threat like I said his his, his a dot air yards uh per average average depth of target which means how much the ball travels in the air uh so it measures like intent of how they're being used if they have low a dot that means they're mostly around this line of scrimmage uh like sweeps and screens type of player that's not good you want the ball to travel a lot in the air so you have a good quarterback because you know that's easier to convert to points so his his air yards a dot is 7.9 and you know on, along those same lines cooper cup is about 8.9 so neither of them are really near the top of the league at all like top of the league you're, you're looking at guys like odell beckham 18 Cortland sudden 17 henry rugg 16 you know a lot higher than that but but you know they combo that with their yak ability both of them are really good at yak so I, I did not account for that value properly. And most importantly, I don't think I accounted for the, the uncertainty involved with the Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk, um, a Brandon Ayuk, um, you know, their gap in their values accurately. So I think that's my my main takeaway there is to be careful there. So uh, in terms of valuing Brandon Ayuk, I don't think I'm going to make too many changes to that process because guys with that profile, like they're just – it's just a very, very high hit rate, and it's a very, very good bet. And he was still very, very undervalued, in my opinion, based on based on the data we did have. He, I, I was getting him in like the fifth round of startups, and at that price, at that type of val- value, I'm gonna pull that trigger more nine times out of ten. But I'm gonna be more careful about those uncertain situations when it comes to guys like Debo and Ayuk and the gap in value they have. I think that's my key takeaway: is don't be too confident in the player that the gap is so far that you're taking on all the risk by betting on him. So I think that's my one key takeaway from that, and like. Like I said, I'm hurting. I'm not fully giving up a brand. I'm not really acquiring him right now, but I'm holding in a couple of paces because I still do believe in talent. Maybe he has a later breakout, like a Tyler Lockett, right? Like a, like a Mike Williams, for example. But 
he's definitely not this season at least i don't think he's gonna he's gonna provide the type of production that we hoped and debo samuel is absolutely the guy there and debo samuel is someone you can acquire i acquired debo samuel in, in a couple of my contending leagues uh I'll, one of the biggest leagues and this is this is a trade where i think i actually lost in value but i had to make it and i'll tell you why i had to give up the 2022 1.01 most likely 1.01 because it's the tanking team uh, especially after this trade uh and i gave up uh that plus two second round picks uh, 2022 second round picks for Debo Samuel, Darrell Henderson, and Michael Pittman. All right, so I'll talk about. Let me talk about the other two players first. Uh, after after I talk about this, but the reason why I made this play, even though I feel it's losing, I I hate trading away 1.01 because that's going to be a very very valuable pick. But I I lost David Montgomery. Dalvin Cook uh, was kind of like hurt, and this is a this is a squad where I was. I won year one. I came second place in year two, and it's a it's an empire pot that I commissioned. So it's a rolling pot, which means that the first player to win three league three uh, three seasons is going to get the empire pot. And even though with all those injuries and stuff like that, I'm still I'm still the most points for. Like last season, I was most points for by like 400 points, and um, I, I still uh, I still lost in the, in the in the finals because like my opponent had like Mike Evans, Devon Diggs, Josh Allen that week. They all fucking blow up. So story of my life, but. I need to win and I, I cannot like just push it out any further. So this is like, I, there's a very short window and my team is kind of at its peak powers. I have Travis Kelsey, Darren Waller. It's a start two tight end, tight end premium league, which is huge. Um, it's a very, very deep league as well. We have to start, uh, I think 11 or 12 players. So, you know, I needed that depth after losing David Montgomery. So draw Henderson was, was, you know, it's not someone I love long-term, but you know, plugging him in, he's getting that workhorse role right now. So he's really going to help me this year. And then Debo Samuel, and Michael Pittman, who I think are going to be more long-term value starters for me, and, and young wide receivers. And my wide receivers are really, really weak. That's a team where I went robust running back um, early on in the startup and just played value wide receiver with guys like Tyler Lockett, Marvin Jones, stuff like that to get me by. Um, so, you know, adding some some top-end wide receivers that have, like, top 12, top 15 upside is pretty important for me. So I made that trade. But I think, you know, if you're trying to acquire Debo Samuel, I'd be trying to get him somewhere in the range of a middling first, right? I wouldn't give up, like, anything above that maybe like a middling first plus a second if you have to because he is still young he can be that cornerstone build um and he can be that guy for you good uh, for the next couple of years assuming he stays healthy um but the, the, those are that's like one move that i'll be making uh to, to replenish because he's he's someone you can get where like he might have that upside I'm, i don't expect him to keep keep up like top five wide receiver upside i don't think that's realistic especially with Trey Lance coming in but he could give you like that top 15 wide receiver with like top 10 upside wide receiver performance right for the rest of the season so I really like that move um, for contending teams. Now, the next mistake that I made, right? And I mentioned the, one of the players already, but it's Michael Pittman. Michael Pittman is someone who I did not like coming into into the draft because he was a fourth-year senior, right? And those typically are not great. He did get the draft capital, so that helped boost him a bit. He landed in a spot where, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to be taken, um, even though it wasn't really with a great quarterback. And then, But he, he didn't really do much in his rookie year. Part of that, though, was due to injury. So that's something to keep in mind, of course. Um, but this year, he has been an absolute fucking baller through four weeks he has a 25 percent target share that is elite 25 when you're getting 25 percent target share that is like top or upper echelon of the nfl but more importantly he is not only getting the targets he's seeing massive massive air yards opportunities so that means that they're throwing it to him deep and they're throwing it to him often and he's a he is over 40 percent no not 40 he is exactly 39.91 so just under 40 percent of his team's targeted air yards that ranks one two three four five six seven eight nine ten top ten in the nfl right and he's averaging about 10.8 uh air yards per target so Again, just very, very good metrics. In terms of measuring his opportunity, he is getting some of the top end opportunity in the NFL. The only thing that hasn't happened yet is converting on touchdowns, right? And we know those are a lot more random. But as long as he keeps accumulating yards, as long as he keeps accumulating targets, he is going to be a very, very valuable asset, uh, both in redraft and in dynasty. He's still young. He's a player that I just was flat out wrong on. And there were some film guys that kind of liked him. Uh, I know Matt Harmon put out a really good profile for him. Uh, I know Brett Coleman, you know, loves him. Uh, Kyle Yates over at Fantasy, Football, Fantasy Pros loved him. But, 
you know, when, when the numbers don't line up for me, I'm, I'm more hesitant to buy in, right? I need to see more data. I need to see more evidence. And especially after the first year that he had, um, granted, it was due to injuries, but, you know, you don't want to buy in on an injury discount on a player with a, with a bad profile. That's not really a positive move. So I'd much rather wait to see some positive signs. And we've seen a lot of positive signs. And the good thing about moving now is, like, there's still a lot of people like me, other analytics people, that will hold on to their priors for a player like Michael Pittman. Like, look at, you know, T- Terry McLaurin after his rookie year. You could still get him for a very reasonable price. Look at guys like, uh, you know, Chase Claypool. You could still get him at a very reasonable price, despite all of their very, very top end, early end production. And Michael Pittman is kind of like on that path for me, right? He's getting alpha target percentage. He's getting alpha air yards. He is the true alpha in the offense. There's no one else. I'm not worried about T.Y. Hilton coming back in um, because, you know, who knows what T.Y. Hilton's going to be doing at this point in his career with all the injuries, with, with, the, with the age that he's at. But Michael Pittman and Carson Wentz, Carson Wentz only has asked for Michael Pittman, right? And they don't really have much competition there, but he's been producing. He's been good, uh, and he's someone that I was wrong on, and I'm going to eat the crow on that one early because the early indications for him is that he is going to be like kind of that alpha going forward. And there has been – I think the lesson learned for me here is like there's there's a lot of really strong indications in the film community. I don't think I'll ever get on board with just going all film uh, because the numbers for analytics side is just, is just overwhelmingly in the favor. But like, you know – I guess Michael Pittman, like he's someone where like he didn't really face plan or flop his first year. It's not like he stunk. It's just that, you know, he got some injuries and when he was on the field, he kind of produced a little bit. So I, I don't know exactly what lesson I'm really taking away from this mistake. But other than the fact that I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing when, with respect to pivoting quickly. Right. It's OK to be wrong and finish football. And that's that's kind of my mantra is like everyone is wrong. Right. It, no, I don't care who you are. If you're Matthew Barry, Ray GQ, you're, you're me, you're Nick. Uh, you, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are. Everyone is wrong sooner or later, but it's how quickly you react and pivot and adjust that information. Now, it doesn't mean you overreact every single time, but if there's enough early indications, you're reading the tea leaves, you're reading the opportunity, you're following the opportunity, you're reading the signaling. Uh, I think then, you know, as long as you pivot quickly and faster than others, there will still be gains to be had. It doesn't matter that you didn't get them at the bow, at the, at the low, at the low point, right? You know, fantasy gamers, NFT investors, everyone's worried about the floor and, and trying to acquire buy low and, and trying to get someone at the absolute minimum. That is not what I do. Right? I don't do that in the markets. I don't do that in fantasy football. I don't, I'm not concerned with being first to market and, and buying at the cheapest possible time. What I'm concerned with is getting in early enough to enjoy the ride and enjoy the gains from there. And that's my philosophy when it comes to investing in crypto and NFT as well. Like I don't concern myself with like floor watching and, and trying to trying to time the market, right? I said this before and I'll say it again. It's easy to beat the market, but it's very, very hard to time the market. So if I see a player, an asset, whatever that I believe in, I'm willing to get in early and, you know, I'll ride out that first time, that first portion of volatility, the, the dips and lows. And I'm OK with with buying higher than someone else. Did. I'm OK. That first investor got like, you know, two, three X returns and, and I'm buying in at triple what he got in at. As long as I believe there is a path and road to more gains. And for players like Michael Pittman, I feel like that's a case for players like Chase Claypool, for players like Terry McLaurin. I bought high on them a lot higher than what I what I had to pay as a rookie. But. They've, they've accumulated in value since, and I believe they will accumulate in value from here on out. And that's my philosophy when it comes to Dynasty, when it comes to everything. That's my mental, that's the that's the mental check that I have uh, when I approach Dynasty. It's not just about buying low and buying at the lowest point ever. I'm okay with getting players a little bit higher as long as there's more room to grow. And I feel like this is a case for Michael Pittman um, where he has that. And I'll, I'll, a couple of deals I did, I, I told you about one of the deals I did for him was a combo deal. Another deal I did for Michael Pittman is a 2014 Superflex Devi. Uh, I gave up a second uh, a second round, two second round picks. So two depleted Devi, but Devi rookie combined second round picks. So I would say like the value of those second round picks are probably close to a, a mid mid to early to mid second round pick in a, in a normal league. So I gave up two second round picks for Michael Pittman in that league. Um, and it's a league I need a wide receiver help and I need a wide receiver depth. All I had was like Hollywood Brown, Stephon Diggs, Allen Robinson and Devontae Parker. And Allen Robinson has been unstartable. So I made a couple moves in that league to get DK Metcalf and Michael Pittman to bolster my, my roster. Um, actually, I made a big deal in that trade, in that league. I'm the defending champ. And again, it has an empire pot component. In 2014 leagues, your odds to win get cut get cut in half compared to a 12 team league, right? There's just way more competition. So the fact that my team is in a position to compete, you know, I have 
Ryan Tannehill. I had Kirk Cousins. I have Saquon Barkley, Nick Chubb, Miles Sanders, uh, Austin Eckler, um, Jonathan Taylor. So I, I went heavy running back in the startup. And then and then I have like Travis Kelsey and Dallas Goddard and stuff like that. So my win window is tiny, but like when you're in it, you got to push all in. So I made a trade. I give a big trade. I give up Miles Sanders. I give up Javante Williams, which hurt the most because I, I know his value is going to go up next year. He could be he's upside to be a top 12 dynasty wide uh, running back. I give up Javante Williams. I gave up Zach Wilson. I gave up Keyshawn Bouti, which really hurt because he was absolutely performing like a stud. Uh, he got injured today, so please okay. But he was performing like a stud up at that point when I traded him. Uh, Quentin Johnston. I gave up a. Uh, I gave up a second a second round pick, a very, very early Debbie second round pick, a very, very early Debbie third round pick. And I gave up all of that for Derrick Henry, Aaron Rodgers, and DK Metcalf. So to me, I probably lose a trade on the value a year out. But again, I need to make that push and just really secure myself in this year and push all in when I can. You know, Zach Wilson isn't someone that I, I can really trust week to week, even though I like his prospects long term. But Aaron Rodgers... You know, having him, Ryan Tannehill, and Kirk Cousins, that's a very, very solid core quarterback. If an injury goes down, I'll still be okay. And then my running backs is just, my running back core is the best in the league. It's not even close. Derrick Henry, Saquon Barkley, Austin Eckler, Jonathan Taylor, Nick Chubb, uh, and James Robinson, right? Like, I have like five of the top 15 running backs in a 24 team league, which is insane. And, and it's a, it's, it's a non PPR league. It's a points per first down league. So, you know, guys like Derrick Henry, just, he's a beast. So, and I made that trade understanding that, Derrick Henry, Aaron Rodgers, probably going to retire on my roster. But I did get a young guy in DK Metcalf that I can build my core around. So that was nice. It was a good balance. But again, you got to be willing to make those moves, right? So made that move in that league with Michael Pittman. So again, mistake learned, but quickly pivoted. And kind of hopefully that helps me push towards the championship, right? And, and that's what it's all about. The last mistake and player I want to talk about is Darrell Henderson, right? I was wrong about Darrell Henderson. I, when I when I saw his ADP, it didn't make any sense to me when he was going ahead of the guys like Miles Sanders, going in that you know fourth round range. But I was completely wrong because they are utilizing him. Um, well, he was hurt a little bit hurt this past week, but up until that point, they were utilizing him as like a workhorse running back, and you know he is producing now. The bitter sweetness in this is that I'm so as you guys know, I'm a Cam Aker stan through and through. Been pounding the table for him since college, uh, so. Watching Darrell Henderson do what he does right now is, and the, and the workload that he's been getting, it, it's great. I'm happy for him, and I'm happy for those people that were that were super in on Darrell Henderson. But it also makes me super sad because if Cam Makers didn't get injured, I feel like I really do feel like that's the workload that Cam Makers would be getting, right? And and that's the part that hurts. But kudos to Darrell Henderson dunked on me entirely. You know, my my philosophy there was like, look. A lot of actions the Rams did told us that he, they don't believe in Darrell Henderson. He wasn't that good, right? You know, they, they went out and drafted Cam Makers the next year. They added some people in the offseason. But he's been good. And I think shout-out to at Jay Moyer FB on Twitter. Um, is it at Jay Moyer or Jay Moyer FB? Sorry, let me double-check that for you guys. At Jay Moyer. Uh, yeah, Jay Moyer FB on Twitter. Um, so he... He did a nice little breakdown. I remember when Joel Henderson first came out and I asked him, like, what do you think about Joel Henderson and him landing on the Rams? And he said, you know, it, it's a little bit tricky uh, because, you know, he doesn't really fit the scheme as well. But Joel Henderson's drastically, drastically improved as a player and, you know, kind of as a, as a fantasy asset. But yeah, for anyone who drafted Darrell Henderson, you're sitting pretty because he is giving you, you know, lower end running back. But he'll probably give you running back one production for the rest of the year as long as he stays healthy. They're in a really good offense. Matthew Stafford's obviously taken that offense to the next level. Uh, a lot more scoring opportunities, a lot more positive game scripts for them there. So a lot of positive things for Darrell Henderson. You know, we love to see him maybe uptick a little bit on the receiving end. He's had a couple games now with only one target, but he also has a couple games with five-plus targets. So it, it, he, he's kind of operating in that running back, workhorse running back zone. So, you know, this is the mistake that I made in the offseason. And what do I learn from this is, is maybe, you know, not, again, just not to be too confident in ding players for, for what they've done in the past. Now, it's hard to do because when you flop as a running back early on, it's kind of it's kind of pretty rare to come back. And had, had Cam Akers not you know, gotten injured, have a career threatening injury. I'm not sure we would be able to see a lot of this from Darrell Henderson, but at his cost though, it was, it was a little bit easier of a pill to swallow, I guess. So, you know, I've made a couple, I didn't make a couple trades. I, cause I have a lot of Darrell Henderson still from his rookie year. Um, I, I believed in him coming in 
And so I have a lot of him from there. And I'm, obviously, you weren't really able to trade him for much over the past season. So I've kind of held on to him um, just naturally. But I made, a, I made a trade for him in that one of the contending leagues uh, that I was talking about earlier where I have, you know, it's a it's an empire pot with first of three wins. And I was a defending champ and came second place last year because I lost David Montgomery, right? And I, did, I had Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, David Montgomery. Dalvin Cook was questionable. David Montgomery got injured for a while. And Darrell Henderson you know, kind of steps in and fills that void for me until, you know, Dave Montgomery comes back and we have a healthy cook later on, hopefully. Right. So, you know, he's someone where I don't know if I want to pay a first for him. I think he, his value kind of lies somewhere lower than a first, but higher than a second. Right. So maybe like a second plus a little bit, second plus a piece to get him uh, or like a first plus Darrell Henderson plus a piece. That's kind of how I created the value um, for myself when I was doing the trade with uh, with like Debo and, and Michael Pittman and Darrell Henderson. Uh, you know, I gave up the, the, the really, really early 2022 first and, and two second round picks for them. Uh, I was valuing Darrell Henderson, like, you know, at like that second to two seconds range to help me kind of, you know, pull through this year. And that's that's where I'd be because, like, we don't know, you know, Achilles usually is a career ender for, for running backs, but we just haven't seen someone in, in, in Cam Akers caliber kind of take that hit and take that injury. But there's a chance that Cam Akers is never what he was before. He's never as productive. And after, you know, if Darrell Henderson continues the season and has this monster year that he has, then maybe the Rams say, okay, look, maybe Darrell Henderson's our guy. So you're kind of shooting for that upside when trading him. But I would not really trade for him on any rebuilding teams because you need the production from now. That's where the value for Darrell Henderson comes from is right now, helping you win this year. If you're not a contending team, I would be looking to offload Darrell Henderson to a contender and try and get a first because I think it's possible. If someone's desperate enough, they will give you a first. It's just not me. I, I don't like to pay first for what I view as like more temporary, not non-safe assets, right? And, and that's what it comes down to for Darrell Henderson. So again, you know, these are the, I think these three players are probably some of the bigger, bigger, you know, whiffs that I had so far this season. And, and I've had other whiffs as well, for sure. And I'll probably have a longer Twitter thread for all the mistakes that I made because it's, it's fun to reflect back. It's fun to like pour your own receipts and, and, you know, make fun of yourself a little bit from time to time. But more importantly, it's fun because I think that's where I learned the most, right? I don't learn as much from like the hits, but I learn a lot from, you know, where I went wrong and, and where I missed. And so I like to focus on that every year uh, in the, you know, after, you know, between now and mid season, I like to look at the trends. I like to look at everything that, that I missed to, to kind of land where I'm at. And those are three players or four players, but the three players that I'm acting on that, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunity for those of you that are making trades now, you know, as a playoff picture is shaping up, as you're trying to make a push for your contending teams, a lot of those are the types of moves that I'd be trying to make. And, and like I said, man, now is ripe for trading. So make sure you guys are getting in there, right? Getting in there. All right. That's all I got for you guys this week. Just a quick recap of what I was wrong on. I was wrong on Cooper Cup. The guy's a fucking baller. If you can get him for cheap, go for it. But he, he seems too expensive and out of the price range in that like Ridley Diggs tier for me to go for. So uh, I'm not really going for him as much. But, you know, like I said, shout out to Cooper Cup. He's freaking balling like a monster. Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk. Brandon Ayuk, man. Man, it pains me to say this. It pains me to see what he's doing uh, to us. But, you know, it is what it is. But Debo Samuel, absolute baller. Go and acquire him for your teams. He's still young. So if you're a competing team, you don't have to worry about him aging out. You can kind of build your core around Debo and bring him onto your core uh, wide receiver group, right? Michael Pittman, I was totally wrong on him as a prospect and definitely wrong on him this year in terms of opportunity, what he's been able to do. So try and acquire Michael Pittman on the cheap while people are still kind of hang, hanging on their priors to, to, you know, see if you can, uh, you know, add them to your teams. And again, build that young core of wide receivers. And lastly, Darrell Henderson, man. Darrell Henderson is a workhorse, man. He is absolutely producing like the workhorse that he was touted to be by Sean McVay this offseason. So uh, hopefully he stays healthy. You know, I know he's battling injuries, but if he stays healthy, right, he's going to be a running back one for you. So if you guys got him in that, in that, you know, in that cheap range if you got him for you know a second round pick if you got him for less than a first round pick you could be looking at a potential uh someone that's going to help you win your leagues this year so again those are the mistakes, mistakes that i've made so far i'm sure I'll, I'll make many mistakes more mistakes you follow me on twitter i talk about it all the time and I, every time i make mistakes i try and break it down into like what lesson i learned what i could have done differently sometimes i don't think there's too much i could have done differently and i'll make that mistake again and that's fine because not everyone I mean, no one, no one has a 100% hit rate. So the key is just trying to understand where, where it went wrong, right? So um, I'll, I'll do a lot more of those breakdowns throughout the season. But hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you did, make sure you head down, hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe, hit the notifications. You get future videos like this one and other ones that Noah's been putting out as well uh, on the channel. Help you guys throughout the season. And then 
Again, make sure you come and check us out on the Discord, man. Come and join the Wolfpack Discord, patreon.com slash rpack. I'm talking a lot of the strategy that you have here. All of my ranks are available. They're updated monthly. I did a huge, huge update of the ranks uh, for this past round to take into account, you know, the first four weeks of the NFL season, uh, taking into account everything that's happened there. So it reflects a lot of the stuff I talked about today with Debo Samuel, uh, you know, Michael Pittman, Darrell Henderson, and all that. So if you want my ranks and, and all that gets updated monthly, you can find it patreon.com slash our packet. But more importantly, it's about all about the discord community and the people that are there. A lot of smart folks in there shooting ideas off each other, bouncing ideas off each other. Uh, and we're constantly talking football theory crafting. Uh, and then, you know, next week I'm probably gonna do an episode on the wolf pack, uh, alphas only league, which is available through the Patreon. We did a 2014 team Debbie league. I'm going to break down some of those teams, how I think they're doing in the season, how I think their draft played out and where I think they went right, where I think they went wrong. That'll probably be uh, next week, a little bit of a longer episode. I'll try and record that. If not next week, then the week after that, um, to do it like a mid season form type thing. Um, but yeah, shout out to all you guys. Shout out to the Wolfpack. If you guys haven't been in there, make sure you get in there. It's the best dollars you ever spent for the NFL season. It's going to slap, right? That's where I do my strategy. That's where like, People learn about my trades and offers as I'm doing them. As soon as I do them, I ping the chat and I'm like, hey, this is a trade I make, I'm willing, I'm willing to make. These are the trades I'm sending out. You guys should go out and do it, um, you know, with your teams as well. And then, you know, I'll come and, you know, if I think it's valuable for the rest of the public, I'll, I'll make a video breakdown. But, you know, the early news and early breakdowns, all that stuff will always be in the Discord first. So make sure you guys check that out. Lastly, talked about this last week, but... Again, I want to stress that, you know, I'm, I'm uh, we're affiliated here uh, with uh, Dynasty Nerds. So if you guys don't know what that Dynasty Nerds are, they're just one of the OG sites. And putting out a lot of really cool tools. The, the most cool tool of all is probably the Dynasty GM. It kind of helps new new Dynasty players help you manage your teams. You know, it has um, all your rosters in one place. It kind of ranks you in terms of your team's value against the rest of your league. So it gives you a sense of where you're at if you're a contender, if you're not a contender. And I get a lot of those questions all the time. Like, how do I know if I'm a contender or not a contender? For me, I just know. But for those of you out there that need a tool to help you, this is a pretty good one. It's a pretty good place to start. And if you go over there, either use the link below that, that I have that link below or just use the 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 promo code Wolfpack. That's promo code Wolfpack. Uh, one word Wolfpack. You'll be able to get 20 uh, percent off any nerd subscription on their site uh, going through me and going through the BDG brand. So, again, make sure you guys check them out. I have all those links down below. I use a product. I've been using them ever since I worked for them. You know, they were my first foray in the vinyl fan first foray in the fantasy industry and uh you know huge amount of respect for all those guys over there and i just i kind of love what they're building so you know i support it i don't i don't really come on here shilling shit that i don't believe in uh, i'm pretty sure this is the first thing i've ever i've ever told you guys to look at so um yeah i mean check it out if you guys like it it's definitely gonna be really helpful for you throughout the both in season and off season so make sure you guys check them out dynastynerds.com i'll have all the links and information below all right that's all i got for you guys this time until next time Peace.